Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming. Do you want me to use the, can you all hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, okay. Well, if you can't hear me, just like raise your hand and I will use the microphone. Um, yeah, thanks for coming and spending your Wednesday evening with us. So I'm Claire, I started as the Singapore Malaysia country manager and now I'm the general manager, which is really just a fancy way of saying I do everything that everybody else in the office does not want to do, including changing the toilet paper in the toilet. Um, and I've been working for Possible for about two years now, and I'm going to go over what crowdfunding is, um, what we see a successful project usually does, so basically how to be successful, and then I'll open up for Q&A. And just to let you know, usually after the, the workshops that we run, people want to stop and talk to me, and that's completely fine. Like if you have a project you want to come ask me about, please do. But if there's like a ton of people and you don't really want to wait around, then you can just email me. Okay, and I will get back to you really quickly. So, can I get, uh, I know earlier Seth asked how many of you know what Possible is. How many of you have actually pledged to a crowdfunding campaign? It doesn't have to be on Possible, just anywhere. Okay, a couple of you. How many of you have a project that you're hoping to start? Okay, interesting. All right. Um, so, a bit about us. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm blocking the thing. Um, we started in 2010 in Sydney. So Possible is an Australian platform. Um, and when we started, there really wasn't, like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, those kind of platforms were around, but there really wasn't anything in Singapore. Oh, sorry, in Australia. And as anybody here who's tried to run a Kickstarter campaign knows, you need to have like a US company. Back then, you need to have a US company in order to start a platform. So Rick and Alan, those guys, they started Possible in order to be able to offer the same kind of funding to Australians. And when we started, a lot of people ask me what's the difference between us and, say, Kickstarter. Um, when we started, we always had a very strong creative community. So Kickstarter is known for like games and tech. We've always been kind of like political causes, musicians, film, uh, designers. Uh, so we have a little bit of a difference in the communities that we run. Our community is now about half a million. Most of those in Australia, but we do have quite a big Singaporean community as well. And most interestingly is really this number which is our success rate. So two out of three projects that start on Possible hit their targets and are successful. That may still sound a bit scary because that means a third of them fail, but if you think that Kickstarter's success rate is about 25%, Indiegogo's is about 9%, 60% is really good. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more later about why I think our success rate is so high. We've had, this is now more than 11,000 projects, and about $45 million raised. So we are kind of on a smaller scale. Um, and our pledges come from all around the world. So anybody with a PayPal account can start a project from Possible, and anybody around the world can support it. There are chairs here, guys, if you want to take a seat. No? Up to you, I'll leave it to you. Um, does anybody here not know what crowdfunding is? No? Yeah, I'll go through it really quickly, just in case someone's afraid to raise their hand. So, Three main things that set crowdfunding apart from other kinds of funding. Um, first of all, you have to have a target, which is basically an amount that you want to raise for your project. It sounds simple, but often a lot of people get stuck on the target because maybe I need to raise $10,000 for my film, but if I can raise $100,000, why not, right? So how do I set a target amount? We usually say it's clever to set a target if you're running a four-week campaign, your target should be something that you could raise 30% of that target in the first week, because that's the point at which we say this, this project's gonna be successful. So if you set a target of $10,000, can you raise $3,000 in the first week from your network, so from the work that you're gonna be doing to promote the campaign? If you think, yeah, that's gonna be easy, then you can moderate the target up, and if you think it's a bit challenging, then moderate it down. But make sure that your target is always the minimum amount that you need to make your project happen. Because when you hit your target, you've got to give people the things that you promised them, right? Second, there's a time frame. The maximum time frame you can run on Possible is 60 days. And a lot of people are like, yeah, I'm just going to go for 60 days, because the more time, the better, right? The thing to note is that there's no correlation between how long your campaign runs and how much you raise. Case in point, this project, uh, it's a hairdressing magazine. It's pretty big in Australia. They were as so many print magazines are, going out of business because printing a magazine is really expensive. Um, so they came to us and said, look, we need to raise $200,000 or we can't print our next issue. And we said, great, let's do it. And then they said, we actually need the money in two weeks. Um, they ran this campaign in four days. 
So, you know, you don't have to run a 60-day campaign to raise lots of money. We also have 60-day campaigns that the whole campaign don't even raise a cent. So the time frame is really thinking about how long do I want to be working on this thing? Because crowdfunding is a lot of work. It's basically like a job that you have while the campaign's running. And we've actually found that creators that have run campaigns with us before, each time they run another campaign, it gets shorter. Because they're like, I just want to get this out of the way. Um, another thing to note, if you're in the startup business, you're probably familiar with the term, the trough of sorrow. And that is down here in a campaign. So when you first launch a campaign, you're pushing it out, you're getting a lot of kind of press, a lot of attention, all your friends are taking a look. You're getting a lot of pledges and a lot of visits to your page. And then time will go on. And there's always, after a couple days, a drop-off. We see this in almost every single campaign that runs on Possible, successful or not. The drop-off is the trough of sorrow. And this is when you feel like everything you're doing, nothing is happening, nothing's converting. And you also start to think, why did I think this is a good idea? This is a terrible idea. This is really embarrassing. Where are all the people that said they love my music and would buy my CD? Where are they? It gets really quiet. And then at the end, because you've got that target, that's when you start to see people coming back to the project. And vast majority of our projects hit their target the last couple of days. Um, and I like to show people this because a lot of the projects on Posible that aren't successful, there's kind of two categories that they fall into. One is they thought that they could just put it up, do nothing, and money would fall from the sky. Two is they worked really hard, and then when they got here, they just gave up. So you really have to keep pushing it until the end. Um, I've had projects that I've advised on that have raised 100000 a day in their last three days. And again, that's because there was the target. Okay, so just push through. Um, the other thing to note is, because I was talking about time frame, if you run a longer campaign, all you're really doing is stretching the trough of sorrow. Because people like to be last minute, right? So they will just all come in pleasure at the end, no matter how long your campaign is. The only reason to really run a longer campaign is if you've got stuff planned in this time. Like maybe there's an event, if you're, if you're doing a comic book, for instance, maybe there's a convention that you need your project to be over this time. Um, or maybe you've already lined up some kind of book tour or something that's going to promote the project. Or you have a magazine that said, okay, I'll write about you, but I can only put you in our August issue. That's a reason to have a longer campaign stretch over that period. But if you don't have a plan, then we usually find four weeks is more than enough for most campaigns. It's important to note that possible, we're all or nothing. So there's a couple of different crowdfunding models up there. They basically fall into all or nothing or flexible funding, which means if you need to raise $20,000 and you only raise $50, you will still get the $50. Um, a lot of people have asked us to be more flexible on this and let people kind of get some of the money. But to us, we're like, you know your project better than anybody. If you say you need $10,000, then you need $10,000. If you only raise $50, maybe from your mom, then chances are you're not gonna be able to do whatever you said you would do, and your mom will be $50 poorer because she's never gonna get that money back. Um, also because crowdfunding is very new, people are kind of hesitant about, you know, am I going to get cheated? Especially like if you've ever run a campaign and you try to get your grandmother to pledge the campaign, which I have done, I got a lot of anxious phone calls to make sure that this was really like, that her money was not going to get cheated. Um, so it's kind of an ethical thing to make sure that people trust us. What happens when you pledge to a campaign, if the campaign's not reached its target, we don't take any money. All we get is permission from the credit card company that when your project reaches its target, then we will take the money. So if you run a campaign, at the end of it, you still haven't reached your target, no money changes hands at all. All right, so you really have to hit your target in order to, to get that money. Right, um, I was hoping to have Rick from Paper Landing, who's actually, oh, there you are, great. Do you want to, you want to come to the sure. front? I will put you here. Okay, I will stick you very here crowded. in front of the screen. Yeah, there are some seats here, people at the back. If you want to come sit down, there's like five seats. Let's come for a um, So Rick is running a campaign right now. Yes, it's <laughs> ongoing. Do you want to tell them a little I'm bit about it? I'm in the trough of sorrow. <laughs> You're in the trough of sorrow, great. Right? You want to tell us a bit about, I guess, why you wanted to crowdfund and how you put it together? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, um, hello, I'm Rick from uh, Paper Lantern Distilling. We are a distillery producing a gin. Uh, we are launching in Singapore. Uh, I've been here in Singapore for four years. Uh, my Two of my three children have been born here at Thompson Medical, so I 
I mean, I know I don't look Singaporean, but I feel Singaporean. Um, and uh, we wanted to make a gin that was a little bit different. So it's uh, based on rice instead of grain. Uh, all the botanicals, except for the juniper, but we're correcting that with the next batch, are all sourced from uh, Asia. So uh, Szechuan is the hero flavor, uh, because most people have heard of it. Everybody knows Szechuan pepper. Uh, but we also use a pepper called the Makawen from Thailand uh, that has a lemony kind of citrus thing. And we use ginger and galangal and lemongrass. Uh, it's actually quite a different take on gin, but uh, it, worked out, it worked out really nicely. And we're distilling that up in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So, uh, a gin that is uh, made from rice and Szechuan pepper is not something that a lot of people would just pick up off the shelf. So one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, well actually, the reason why we crowdfunded was twofold. Number one, it's a great awareness vehicle for people. Um, when people see it, they send it around to their friends. It's got a limited timeline on it, so it inspires people to, as opposed to a new product in the stores, oh okay. You can buy it any time. It's always going to be there. But this is kind of a limited timeline thing, and that gets people excited. Um, the, the second piece of it is when you're making a, a product as opposed to a service, every fee that you pay is upfront. So when you get your bottles, you have to buy your bottles in advance. When you pay your designers for the label, you got to pay them in advance. You have to pay your distiller. You have to pay for your ingredients. You have to pay for uh, space on the still. You have to pay for your, your cork. You have to pay for the little plastic thing that goes over it. Everything is up front and everybody wants their money up front. So by pre-selling bottles here, or by crowdfunding for the reward to be a bottle, because they're not purchasing the bottles through the site, they're donating money to the campaign and then the reward is a bottle. We're uh, effectively moving our cash flow further up than it would be if it hit the retail stores. So for us, that was a very important vehicle as well. Granted, we're producing more than uh, is available on here, but we're offering a, a special price on here as well for people. Um, one of the things that I have found most cool about the crowdfunding experience is, sure, you get your friends and family, and they're the first people that are gonna donate and give money. And I missed the first couple of minutes, so I don't know if you said it, but uh, it's critical, it's really important to uh, whatever your target is gonna be, to secure, I, I would say, a, at least 10% of your target that you know you're gonna hit within the first couple of days. So you get your friends to promise that they're gonna, they're gonna donate. You, you generate that support and that structure because, uh, you know, all right, so this is a very Singapore thing. Um, it doesn't happen anywhere else in the world that I know of. But uh, I have seen people rushing to get into a line, a queue, and they didn't know what the queue was for, but other people were queuing, so they wanted to get in because they didn't want to miss it. It's very kyasu, you know? So, um, and then they'll ask other people, what's the queue for, right? But they don't want to miss their spot. Crowdfunding is the same way. If you see a campaign and it's on its 15th day and it's raised $20, you think, oh, well, it, I'm not even gonna click on it. It's clearly not quality for me. It's clearly, clearly not interesting. But if you look at a campaign and just a couple hours have gone by and it's already at 10%, you think, oh, I gotta get involved in this. What's, what's going on? You'll at least click on it and then watch the video and read the story and learn a little bit more about it, which is, is critical and important as well because you should spend a lot of time on making this right. Um, the crowdfunding experience also provides you with, after your friends and family, that that group of early supporters. And these are people that you've now established a community with. Um, in a lot of industries now, it's the big businesses that always win, and crowdfunding is a way to kind of take us small guys who don't have a lot of money and, and push us forward and get us out there and get a group of people that not only care about what you're doing, but they care about who you are, uh, they care about why you're doing it, and they want to be part of the story as well. And with crowdfunding, it allows people to be part of the story. It allows them to be your early group of founders and supporters that then you can continue to engage with and have conversations with going forward. Um, which, is, if anybody's in marketing, that's kind of the hallmark of what you're trying to do in marketing. You're trying to get that one-on-one -on -one relationship with your customers or with your supporters. Crowdfunding does that. It does that for you right from the start. And then uh, you can take this group of people and move forward as you go along. Um, all right, I'll talk a little bit about yeah. setting it up. Yeah, can I keep going? Um, I'll keep going and then I can... Okay, bring me back in. Back to you. Sure, you yeah. Can take a seat here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. 
So yeah, that was really good. Okay. Um, it's always good to hear straight from a creator. I've run a campaign before, and honestly, it was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. I made the mistake of doing it after I joined Possible, which means that if I'd failed, they'd also have to fire <laughs> me, uh, which made it even more scary. But yeah, it's um, it's one of those things where you're always glad that you did it after you do it, but then when you're in it, you're like, why did I do this? Yeah, when you're going to push that launch button, yeah, uh, yeah. you go away from the page a couple of times before you actually do it. Yeah. Like, Should I really be doing this? So, um, yeah, I guess, and the, and the last thing that makes crowdfunding different from just donating money to someone, because a lot of times when people write about crowdfunding, they talk about crowdfunding, they talk about donations, is that you're giving people something in return for their pledge. So it's not just like you begging people for money. Preferably, you should be giving them something that they actually want. Right? You're bringing them in, like Rick said, bringing them in on something that's exciting and that they want to be part of with you. So there's three main kinds of rewards. Uh, the first one is recognition, which is basically recognizing someone by saying thank you for something that they've done. The most common recognition is like, we'll give you a Facebook shout out. Right? Maybe $5, we'll say thank you on Facebook, or we'll follow you on Twitter, we'll send you a little postcard that says thank you. Um, we've had venues that have crowdfunded with us, so like cafes, our most successful project ever in Australia, and I love this, was a pub, because have you been to Australia? They really love beer. Um, and they said that if you pledged $5,000, they'd put your name on one of the chairs in the pub, which would just be forever. Um, so that's a good example of recognition. My favorite recognition reward ever, and I say it at every workshop, is was a video game. And if you pledged $1,000, they would build a statue of you in the game for people to I shoot at, I guess, because that's what they do in games. <laughs> but I just love that so much, because who wouldn't want to be in a game? I almost bought it, but no. Um, OK, so that's recognition. And just one last note on recognition. Sometimes when I talk to people about crowdfunding, and I tell them about recognition rewards, they're like, really? Someone's going to pay me to send them a thank you card? But we really shouldn't us underestimate how much recognition matters to people because who doesn't like getting mail or who doesn't like getting a phone call that says look I couldn't have done this without you thank you so much people love to be thanked so whether or not you've given someone a recognition reward when your campaign's over make sure that you thank them because these are your community these are your early adopters you want to treat them really really well um sorry people at the back shall move out of the way uh the second one is tangible rewards which means you're giving someone something that they can hold in their hand so if you have a product like Rick, that's easy because you just give them your product, right? And often our product campaigns, whether it's a book or a gin or a movie, you're often pre-selling something. So rather than I'm just going to borrow some money from the bank or from my really wealthy relatives, if you're lucky, and then I now have to pay them back, even if my idea fails, you say, okay, let's try this. These people keep saying that they would love to buy my book if I ever write it. So I'm actually going to put it up there and they can buy it. And now I'll see how many of those people were actually telling the truth. And if you raise the money, then great, you can make your book. If you don't raise the money, at least you don't own the bank a pile of money plus interest. So it's a great way to test stuff out. So um, tangible rewards. I think one of my favorite rewards that I didn't manage to get was from the substation. So this is interesting because they were actually raising funds to renovate the substation gallery, right? So it's not really a product. They can't give people the gallery. Uh, they can give people space in the gallery, but that's a very specific reward. So they had to kind of think up all these things that regular people would like to get. So the standard is like t-shirts, tote bags. But then they also had this reward of which they only gave out five. And it was, you know that big, beautiful tree that grows outside the substation, the banyan tree? They actually took cuttings from that tree. So you could own, you could go and grow it in your house depending on how good you are with plants, I'm very bad, um, you could have part of the substation growing in your house. And I thought that was so special because that's a reward you can't get anywhere else. Um, companies, uh, things like gin, they will often say, we'll give you the first batch and it's a special numbered bottle. So you may not even want to drink it or you'll save it for a special occasion. But it's that reward that you can't get anywhere else. Those are really good rewards to have. Um, Cynthia, she raised funds last year to do a film called Singapore Minstrel. It was shown at the Singapore International Film Festival this year, and I think it's just gotten into another festival. She made t-shirts. The t-shirts cost her like $2 to buy from Art Friend, and then she just tie-dyed them with her friend and then wrote the thing on. So again, the reward did not cost her a lot of money, but it was something special that people could get. You really don't want to be spending a lot of money on rewards because you've got to put all that into your target amount. And we have had projects that like, yeah, we raised $20,000, but we're going to spend $10,000 printing the t-shirts. And 
$5,000 mailing them out to people. So make sure you factor all these costs in. Um, the last kind is experience rewards. So you're still giving someone something, but it's an experience that they can't get anywhere else. So the online citizen ran a campaign with us. Was it last year, general election, 2015? They ran two sets of campaigns, raised $60,000 in total to try to fund their coverage of the general election. And they gave out workshops. One of their rewards was a workshop. So they'll actually teach you how to report on the election for all the people that want to go to the rallies and contribute to the online citizen and you know get their name in print kind of thing. Um, and that was really clever because not only is it like an experience reward that people want, but they are basically getting free labor and they're being paid for it. So it's like, I will pay them to write for their website. So it was really, really clever. So they had all these kind of citizen journalists that they trained and then went out and were contributing to the coverage of the election. Um, we've had uh, wildlife sanctuaries in Australia that funded with us and their rewards were like a candlelit dinner for two in the wildlife sanctuary. So really special, something you don't get access to every day. Again, when you think about your rewards, think about all the different people who are the target audience you're trying to reach and what they want. Not everybody is going to want a tie-dye t-shirt. Not everybody is going to want a thank you on Facebook. So make sure that you've got something that encapsulates each of those different people that are going to be pledging to your, to your campaign. Um, we generally find that five to eight rewards is a good number. Um, the most popular reward tier is $50, followed by $25, followed by $100. So make sure you've got those three numbers. And then you can kind of, you know, mediate up or down depending on what you want to do. Is that the same in Singapore? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. What did you find? Like, was there anything special that you learned about the whole reward planning process? Um, no. I mean, we, uh, so when you set up your campaign on Causable, they're actually really great about uh, giving you feedback. And uh, you can ask them questions. You can set up calls with them. And they're extremely helpful because, you know, they, they want to see you succeed as well. Um, and so they suggested for us that we had some uh, lower tier rewards because our lowest tier is $100, which is a bottle. Um, and then we have two bottles and, uh, you know, and it costs slightly less, I mean very slightly less, but slightly less for if you go up in numbers. So we have one, two, six, and 12. 12 is just the big one that you put up there. Nobody's going to buy 12 bottles at the same time. But um, uh, we found that most of the stuff was the one and two bottles. Yeah. Um, we, we did sell a couple of six bottles, yeah, so like my, my dad bought six bottles, <laughs> which is nice. Thanks, Dad. I, I can't deliver them to you because we live in Boston, up back home. But um, uh, no, I found that most people who are familiar with what you're doing and spirits and things like that will go with the two bottles. Yeah. But people who just like what you're doing and want to support you go with the one bottle. So I don't, I don't know if that... Yeah. Helpful, well, no, it's exactly that. It's knowing your target audience and what they're willing to spend. So we've had campaigns. For instance, we had this campaign in Australia, which was so weird, and I love it so much, because it was this tiny, tiny town that I think has maybe a 1,000 people in it, in a, in a place called Collinsville uh, in Victoria. I think it's about three hours out of Victoria. And they're a mining town. And as you, if you know anything about Australia, you know that the mining industry has slowed down. A lot of mines are closing down. And this town kind of lost its mind. And then they were like, well, what are we going to do? And of course, they were like, well, we'll become a tourist capital. And we're going to do this by building a giant statue of a pony in the middle of the town. Because that's what tourists want to see. Um, and they came to us. And we were like, OK. Like, we'll never tell someone it's not going to work. We'll all, because people always prove us wrong. And they, pro they proved us wrong. They wanted to raise $150,000. They raised $200,000 to build the statue of a pony in their city. Um, and they did that by having small rewards that were like 25 to to $100, and a lot of people pledged for those rewards. So when they'd gotten to about $50,000 from those 25 to to $100 rewards, they started to go to businesses in the town and saying, look, the town really cares about this. People really want to see this happen. Will you come in as a sponsor? And they have rewards that were like 10000 20000 50000 that were obviously meant for businesses. But they didn't just sit there and wait for the businesses to come to them. They actually did the legwork to talk to these businesses and say, when we've got 200 supporters, will you step in and pledge $50,000? So they had kind of a whole plan for it. So it was knowing the different groups that would be interested in a project like this. All right, so I'm now kind of going to go through the different qualities of a good campaign. Um, the first one is to have a personal story behind it. 
Uh, this is usually very easy if you're a musician or if you're doing a project that is a cause. But sometimes the people that struggle with this are maybe like tech companies or big businesses that want to use crowdfunding, but they don't know how to get away from their brand. And if, what we found is that the more you push a logo at people or you know hide behind your brand, you, it doesn't work in crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is about being vulnerable, um, being honest with people, and connecting with them in a really personal way. And I think you guys did a really good job of that in your video. Thank you. Can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. Uh, I wrote like five or six different scripts for the video, each script getting shorter and shorter and shorter, because when you you sit there and then you time yourself reading it aloud, and you know, when it's, when it's past like six minutes already and you're still on the first page. And so you don't have to say a lot, um, but I don't know, it's, it's, for me it gets down to why are you doing it? And you're typically doing it because it's something that you're, you're passionate about, it's something that you love. And uh, <coughs> the best way is if it's a couple of different things that, that you love coming together. So um, I like alcohol. Um, I like the production of alcohol, uh, but I really like ingredients a lot. And uh, we hadn't even really thought of doing anything like this until we got here to Southeast Asia and just saw all of the fruits and all of the spices and all of the different cuisines. And, um, you know, America likes to talk about itself as a great melting pot of cultures, but it's really just cultures spread out all over the place. Here, we don't have room to spread out all over the place. So we've got all of these cultures kind of mixed together right here uh, in this tiny little island. And, um, you know, it's just a lot of great opportunity for flavor expressions that came out. And so, uh, you know, for us, it was kind of talking about that, uh, talking a little bit about who you are, but um, more, I think, for me, the personal story element is uh, expressing your love. Uh, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? What, what makes you excited about it? If you've ever watched motivational speakers, you know, if you've ever been up in the middle of the night and you're watching those weird infomercials on TV selling you know, like a mop that mops better than other mops or something, um, you know, the ones that you go, maybe I should buy that mop. The people are passionate about it. Like, this guy loves this mop. He loves it. And that kind of, you can feel that, that passion coming out. All the campaign videos we watch, the ones that we really love, where the people, they weren't trying to sell you anything. They were just trying to tell you about what they were doing and why they loved what they were doing. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so this is a project, I don't know if you can read it, it's really small. This is a project, a Singaporean project from last year or the year before, um, and it was called Rude Packets. I'm not sure if anybody heard of it. They only wanted to raise $2,000 or something like that. So a really, really small project. But what they are is they're, they're red packets that have like funny messages printed on them and they're to give to people at weddings. So like this one says, advanced baby bonus. And I think there was another one that said like, this is 0.01% of your car's COE or something like that. So they were very, very Singaporean. And the reason that they did it was, she actually wrote this whole thing about going to a wedding and freaking out because you don't have an angpao and you need to give money and then you go and dig and you find one and it's like super Chinese New Year kind of angpao. And then you have nowhere to write on it to say like this is my angpao from you know you put your name and usually they're like some weird material that you can't write and the pen keeps coming off and then finally when you do it you, your friend doesn't even remember anyway or doesn't read the note because there's so many angpaos and they all look the same and there's nothing to distinguish them from each other so she wanted to create one that actually had space for you to write and that was funny enough that it would catch people's attention and it would be more of a personal message right so those of you who are used to going to like western weddings and then Singapore, Asian weddings. The Westerners always feel a bit weird about giving money because it feels so impersonal. So this is kind of like a nice mix of the two things. But she had this whole fake story about it, like how she went to a friend's wedding and this huge disaster happened and they almost stopped being friends all because of an ang pao. Whether or not it's true, I don't know, but it was interesting to read and it kept you reading through the page. And by the end of it, you're like, yeah, I like this person, I like the story. I'm gonna give them $15 or whatever it is to get the ang pao. Um, so really think about your story and what's special about your story and don't be afraid to be really personal with it. Okay, next one, graphics and visuals. Um, I think Rick's project, if you take a look at it, does a really great job of this. And if you're doing a project that has a product, you have to make sure that your product looks beautiful, that you invest in good photography or just find a friend who can take photos or for God's sake, just learn how to take photos, don't backlight it and all that kind of stuff. Like, this is really important because this image, the hero image, the main image, this is what will make someone click on your project. 
And this main image is also what we use across Plausible. So every time we do social media, we'll use this image. Newsletter, we'll use this image. And often if there's a project, even if it's a really great project, but the image is terrible, we won't use it because we know that people will not click on it. So you lose that kind of chance. Um, this applies also when you're trying to get the press to write about you. You have to have nice, high-resolution images that they can immediately print in a newspaper or in a magazine. Um, so think carefully about the images that you use on your project. These are some images that creators used um, to promote the project. So they would share these or they would put these on their page whenever they hit a certain goal. So there was a whole branding that went into their project. And every time an image like this showed up on a Facebook wall, their supporters could recognize, okay, this is an update about this project. Okay, but that's kind of the extra mile. Most of our projects don't do this. All right. Um, Rick talked a bit about his video. You don't have to have a video. But we find that projects with a video raise about five to six times more than those without. Now that could just be because people that have already spent time with the video would also then spend a lot more time on their project than people that don't. But I think it's also because people don't read anymore. <laughs> right? So if you've got like a super long project text and there's no images, it's not going to do as well as one that has a video and really nice images in it. Don't make your video longer than two minutes. How long was your video? like 220 two, two or something. 220, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we found that the average time a person spends on a crowdfunding page is about about two and a half minutes. So that includes the time it takes to look at all the rewards, choose one, put in their credit card information, all of that. So if you've made like a 10 minute long diatribe about how much you hate the PAP, they're only watching the first 30 seconds and then they decide based on that, am I going to pledge to you or not? So you can have a longer video, but put the most important information in the beginning. Another thing that you can do is, if you want to have a longer video, you can have several versions of your video. So you can have one that's one to two minutes that goes on the top, and then you can have longer versions in the body of the project. You should also have a version that is for social media if you're going to do a social media campaign, right? So like, if you notice on Facebook, um, there are videos, the videos autoplay, right? And a lot of videos usually have text now because the sound doesn't autoplay. So something like that that's really quick, almost like 5 to 10 to 15 seconds long, and that has text on it, that can be quite effective. Um, I'm going to try to play you some videos, but the first thing I'll say, I guess, is that there's actually no correct way to make a crowdfunding video. A lot of people freak out about the crowdfunding video because they think like, oh no, I'm going to spend all this money on it, or I don't know how to take a video, I don't know how to edit it, but there's really, there really is not one way to make it. Again, you go back to having a personal story um, and making sure that that comes through in your video. And thinking about your target audience, right? Because crowdfunding is basically like running a marketing campaign. So who's your target audience? What is going to make them put their money down? So these are kind of a couple different videos we have. Um, this video was kind of, and I think Rick's is probably similar, it's like the typical crowdfunding video. There's, you can see the creator's face, it's like an appeal to camera, it's beautifully shot. Um, this one was specifically about saving the National Forest of Victoria. So they're trying to make the National Forest bigger so that it can be preserved for future generations. So it's like a really huge, amazing project. I think David Attenborough got on board, like really kind of inspiring stuff. Um, and their video was all like beautiful footage of the forest, showing people what they're saving. And then this project, which I love to compare it to, was literally about maggots and flesh-eating bacteria. So you compare these two. These people could have easily said, there's no way to sell maggots to people. Nobody's going to want this. But they didn't. They totally went with it. So the first video they made was very similar to this one. It was, it's a research project, and it's about them studying how maggots can be used to treat flesh-eating bacteria. So the video was the two scientists, kind of really nicely shot, explaining why maggots and flesh-eating bacteria are important to everybody. They found, after running the campaign for about two weeks, Nobody was watching this video. It could have been because the science talk was too sciencey. It could have been because it was maggots. It could have been any number of reasons, but people weren't watching it, right? So they decided rather than just give up and say like, oh, nobody likes that project, they changed the video. The new video was they took maggots, they dipped them in paint, they put them on a canvas, and then they sped the video up. So the maggots were painting. And then of course they gave that canvas away as a reward. Um, and one of our co-founders has one hanging in his bathroom. This is, he calls it his maggot painting. He loves it. Um, and a lot of people watch this. A lot of people shared it on Facebook because it was so weird. The first time it plays, you're like, 
what is that? And then you keep watching, and then you're like, wow, this is so, this is so weird and clever, or freaky, whatever. You either show it to someone, or at the very least, you'll pledge some money into their campaign. All right. So, I guess two lessons there. One, again, there's no correct way to make a video, and two, track. Try to try to really track every aspect of your campaign. See whether people are watching your video. I think YouTube and Vimeo both have statistics around this that are free. Um, you can also, I think, see how far in people are watching your videos. You can get a <laughs> That's sense disappointing. of yeah. Didn't see that. <laughs> did you? Did you? Did yeah, you know yeah. So I, I did it on you. Vimeo, and yeah. um, you can see that uh, your video. How many times it's been played? I haven't looked at the updated statistics, but uh, I think only about uh, eleven percent of people made it all the way through the video. <laughs> and that could have been because they fell asleep or went away and let it play. Yeah, or I, I wonder also, um, you know, when it gets to the end and then it, you know, because we have a couple of things of credits at the end where it just oh, okay. not not credits, but it says, you know, like this is a link to our possible in case people put it elsewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, and you can reach us at this website. By, by then, I think you know you've yeah. clicked off. But yeah. still, at the same time, eleven percent. I'm like, it's only two minutes. It's, <laughs> You know, it's not that big of a yeah. commitment, but yeah. yeah. But that's a really good point. Make sure that when you have a link, that your link is either all the way through the video. Um, yeah, actually, that's the best thing. Just make sure it's all the way, not just at the end. Because if your video gets shared to other places, people don't. The link doesn't often come with it. So you want to make sure there's always a very clear call to action for people to find your link. I'm gonna see if I can play some videos. I'm gonna play yours, and then I'm gonna play. Oh, oh dear work. lord, yes. Um, one other thing <laughs> with the video is, uh, believe it or not, not just the video, but um, so do you guys notice a button on the page right here? Uh, we get messages on Possible from a lot of people saying, so how do we, uh, how do we order a bottle? <laughs> um, and you have to, you know, very patiently explain, oh, well, there's a pledge now button. You know, it's like the, when you're at the, uh, the store and you say, well, where do I pay? And they're like, you see that giant sign that says checkout? Right under there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's also probably the language that you use. Someone that's not accustomed to a crowdfunding site may not know what pledging is. Mm, or it's, that's fair. They may think pledging is like, I swear to tell the truth and love you forever or something. So. Don't like. Don't use the word donate. Use the word pledge, and use it in the video as well. Okay, let's see how far this plays because we had some issues earlier. I'm gonna make you bigger. Oh, I'm gonna make you bigger. When we first came to Southeast Asia, everywhere around us was this amazing variety of fruits, vegetables, and spices. We've been making alcohol at home forever, so the ingredients are always exciting for us. We were out one night for a few drinks with some old friends, talking about Asian flavors, and someone brought a special on pepper. We knew right then that is what we had been looking for. So we decided to take our local ingredients and see if we could get some of the rich local flavors distilled into a spirit. We start with hand-picked Thai rice, ferment on site at the distillery, and then triple distill on a beautiful copper pot still. We layer in the very best regional flavors and aromas. Ginger, galanga, lemongrass, and of course, special pepper. Finished with a kiss of Thai honey, I think our distillers have achieved something really special. We're putting together this possible campaign to help finance the project and our dreams of making a truly unique gin. And we need your help. We are not asking for donations. We want you to become one of our first customers. With your contribution, you are pre-purchasing a bottle of our beautiful gin. Handcrafted, hand number, limited edition, batch number one. Everything we do happens right here in Southeast Asia. We're producing our spirit in Chiang Thailand, sourcing our rice and botanicals from the local markets, and launching in Singapore. As a small producer, we don't have the same resources as the large distillers. We're raising money to help fund the prime stages of our first production run and allow us to get started on the second batch. We've spent two years on building the idea, getting the right team in place, and figuring out the recipe. We've taken almost 100 different assemblages to perfect. Right now, we have 1,000 liters of gin waiting to be bottled and shipped to Singapore. Be an early supporter of this new venture and help us craft a new chapter in Asian gin. This journey is going to be a lot of fun. Come celebrate with us. Your favorite Thank you very much. Cheers. Right. Okay, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to go straight to the next one, and then we're going to talk about them.
Natalie and Bruglia's sister. Sorry. She's Natalie and Bruglia's sister, but she purposely doesn't use any of her sister's fame to try to get ahead. She really wanted to do her own thing. Um, and she did like two of the biggest no no's. One is using a webcam to shoot a video, um, and two is using jump cuts, which is just like you just cut from thing to thing and it's really disorienting. But because her personality is so great and she obviously thought about this video really carefully, it just works. And you can tell immediately whether you like this person and you're almost pledging just because you like the person as opposed to even hearing her music. She didn't play any of her music in that video and it's a music crowdfunding project. So really interesting. So two very different videos. Um, the thing that I will note is that you can probably tell at some point in the video when your attention is starting to, to kind of go away to somewhere else, right? So think about what it was that made you switch off. Is it like she was talking about something you didn't really understand? Was it the sound was bad? A lot of people forget about how important sound is in video. So yeah, your picture could be great, but if people can't hear what you're saying, then there's no point, right? Um, or it could you just spin that it was too long. It's always worth showing your video to people to, getting, to get their feedback. Did you do that? Did you show your video to yeah, people? Yeah, we showed the video to a bunch of different people, um, and we watched it ourselves a painfully large number of times. <laughs> yeah, and you need to be showing it to your friends who are honest. Mm -hmm. You know, like not the ones that you always hear about on American Idol that they're like, oh, my friends say I sing so well, and it's because it's not so well. You need to find the people that would just tell you the truth. Um, because you want to make sure that your, your video will appeal to people that don't know you, right? OK. 
Okay, so that's video. Um, Alright, so the next thing I'm going to talk about, which Rick touched on a little bit, was promotional strategy. So I think a lot of times people spend so much time on the photographs, the video, the description, the rewards, and then they launch it and they're like, yay, and then they're like, oh shit, now I've actually got to promote this thing, right? You want to make sure that your promotional strategy is in place way before you even launch, that you know what you're going to be doing day by day. And the reason for that is because once you launch, it's really, it goes very fast and you don't want to be playing catch up to it. Like Rick said, you want to be doing really well in those first couple of days because that will determine how well you continue to do through the project. Um, and it doesn't have to be something really complicated. You don't have to be a marketing guru or anything. Uh, one thing that I tell people is just draw up a list of everybody who would be interested in pledging to your to your project. And this is whether they know you or not. It could be general, like soccer moms or aunties in the hawker center, whatever. Just have a list of all the people that you're going to try to reach out to. And then order that list according to the people who are most likely to give to your campaign. And those people should be the ones that you contact first. So they'll often be your friends and family or people that have kind of, if, if you're like a musician or a filmmaker, those people that have like kind of gone to every single gig or screening that you've ever had. So you know that these people really, really love your work. Um, treat these people really well. You can contact them even before the campaign launches and let them know it's coming. You can write them a personal email, which is what I did for my campaign, on the day that it launches and say, look, it's really important that I raise this money as quickly as possible so that other people will pledge to my project. It would mean a lot to me if you think you're going to pledge, pledge today, like on this day. And those people will go into your campaign and they will pledge money. You'll get a couple hundred, couple thousand dollars. Then you go to the next group of people. The next group of people are people that are in your networks, they know you, but you're not completely sure that they will pledge. Then you reach out to them. They'll go into your campaign and say, oh, look, all these other people have already pledged. Something good must be happening. And then they're more likely to pledge. And then you go to the next group and the next group. And so you're trying to create this snowball effect. Often we've had campaigns that kind of go by the traditional PR marketing strategy, which is everything goes out on launch day. So like press releases, uh, social media, everything goes out. And what happens is you've got lots of traffic, but everybody's going there and seeing that nobody's pledged yet. So the people that don't know you are like, this is a crappy project. I'm just not going to waste my time putting my credit card details and I'm just going to go. And this is what happened to the pub project that I mentioned earlier. They actually got on the front page of one of our biggest newspapers on day <coughs> one. And there was tons of traffic, no pledges, because they went zero. Right? So you have to kind of stagger it in that way. Um, I wanted to ask you, you got quite a lot of press attention. How did that happen? Were you actively pushing it out? Yes. Yeah, okay. So what did you do? Um, so we, we anticipated that effect and we were concerned about it. Um, one of the things we didn't do, but uh, only because we thought about it too late, we, we actually read a lot about crowdfunding and looked at a, a bunch of other successful campaigns. If you know you've got friends and family that will be your first like 50 supporters or something, you can have limited rewards. So you have a reward that there are only 50 of them available. So you know if those people pledge first, they get a greater reward than the next tier would be. Um, so then people, oh, well, I missed that one, but oh, let me let me get the next reward. So that, that's one thing. But um, So we did uh, just a little press at the beginning, just to get a little attention. And then we did uh, Facebook, and we sponsored a Facebook post, uh, and that went around a lot. Um, it, that actually, that was pretty good for us in terms of people sharing it and sending it around. Um, and then since then, a lot of the press has actually been uh, contacting us okay. uh, and asking us about things just because it's um, it's alcohol and I don't think there's a ton of, uh, especially Southeast Asian, most people picture the, the bottle with the dead scorpion in it. You know, we've all seen that, right? The and you're like, drink yeah. it, drink it. You're like, I'm not going to drink that. This is gross. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think there's there's a, a hook angle for, for stories with that, but especially if you guys are doing something that's kind of fun and interesting and, and something new. Um, remember, the guys who are writing the articles and having the websites, uh, like it's work to find the content to fill that stuff. So a lot of people are really open to hearing about your story. Um, one thing that is key and critical for any sort of press is write it up beforehand yourself. Because you'll get contacted and they'll say, uh, so we need you to answer these 10 questions by tomorrow because we gotta go to press right away. It's all a deadline business. Everybody's running up against deadlines. 
And then if you look at the questions, and you've honestly never thought, you know, why, you know, why did you choose rice as your base botanical? Like, what does that do that's different in the gin? So uh, we spent a lot of time with, uh, we just came up with as many ridiculous questions as we could think of. And, uh, you know, I spent an entire weekend just with my laptop typing up answers to all of the questions. You know, what's, what's your message? What's your, uh, why, why are you doing this? Why do you love this? Why Singapore? Why uh, Szechuan? Why gin? Um, are you, aren't you worried the market is saturated? Why Asia? Why are you here? Who are you? What are you doing? Well, why are you making me drink this? Like, you know, all, any ridiculous question you can think of and then answer it. And then when you finish, when you get those questions, even if they're different, you're like, I got this. Boom, you can just roll your answers right out because you know your message, you know what you're trying to do. And then in terms of, you know, if you want to write a business plan, if you want to do all those other things and, and expand beyond it, or if you want to write little sales copy or advertising copy, it's just, it's easy, it just happens. Because now you, you understand your own message. So that, that was that was key for us. I think. Yeah, I think an, an important thing that I picked up from that as well is think of all the different angles that your story has. So for instance, um, I worked, because I, I, I handle PR at Possible, and, and I'll just go through the site and choose interesting projects that aren't doing really well, and I'll try to get them some press attention. And um, one of them was a sushi, vegetarian sushi uh, cafe setting up in Sydney. So obviously, I immediately think, who covers vegetarian stuff? So I'll look for any vegetarian food magazines, food magazines in general, kind of like healthy website, all those kind of like new age mama, all that kind of stuff. Those are the people I'll contact. I didn't even think to contact the big papers, because I think of those people first. Those are like the easy ones that are going to write about this. And then I found out a bit more about the project. Oh, it's a mother and son. Okay, M Mother's Day is coming, so obviously this is a very good story, like a mother and son starting a business together. So that was a different angle, and I sent it out to different people. Um, I think there was like the kind of rice that they were using is grown in a certain part of Australia, so I was like, okay, I'll contact all the rural uh, magazines, the ones that's right about farming and all that kind of stuff. So think of the different angles. Don't just go with one thing that you send out to everybody. Because journalists want to feel special, like you, you know them, you know who they are. Um, and there are a lot of good options for that here in Singapore too. Um, you know, uh, so uh, I actually have a full-time job, and so I'm doing this kind of at night. Uh, but uh, my wife quit her full-time job to focus exclusively on this. So there are a lot of great women entrepreneurs networks here, um, like Crib Society, Athena, um, uh, some other ones. Um, but there are also bloggers of every uh, every single niche interest you could possibly have. There's probably left-handed chess players like clubs <laughs> here in Singapore, and uh, there are bloggers that write about all the left-handed chess players in Singapore. It's just that it probably doesn't exist, but it may now. Um, but uh, so you know, also explore those niches. Like people, people are interested. People want to talk about stuff, and people are also interested in other people talking about stuff. There's so many opportunities for that here, almost more than anywhere else. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So uh, I just like to show this little graphic because um, it just talks about the most efficient ways that you can use social media. So you don't have to use social media. A lot of our campaigns. Don't use social media at all, that's completely fine. But if you're going to, this tells you what people share most often on social media. And the number one thing is pictures. So not even videos. So this is not just what people are liking. Likes make you feel great, but they don't actually do anything because it's just one person seeing it. Um, sharing is what you want. So you want to create content that, you know, your mom's going to like it great, but is she going to share it? Are other people going to understand what it is if they don't know who you are? So think about that. Um, why people share content, also very interesting. The number, reason, number one reason why they share is because it's a way to support causes or issues that they care about. So think about what your project is tapping into. You may think like, I'm making gin, there's no cause, like Alcoholics Anonymous is not gonna love me, but you know, it's about someone quitting their job to start something that they love, or it's about appreciating kind of the qualities of Asian ingredients. So think about a bigger kind of theme that you're tying into, and try to kind of run with that. Most shared emotions. So the, the number, the two biggest things that are shared are things that make you feel inspired, something that creates awe, and things that make you laugh, right? The, the one that's not shared at all is sadness. This is really important to remember when you're in the trough of sorrow and things seem like really bad. You don't want to share a picture of yourself crying or something, <laughs> even though you, you feel really bad. So try to put a spin on it, try to make it funny and relatable, 
always try to kind of go back to those two emotions, right? You want people to be inspired by what you're doing so that they want to be part of it, or you want to make them laugh so they like you so they want to be part of it. Um, this is the Great Forest National Park campaign. Their whole campaign was pretty much just Instagram-sized images that they shared on Facebook. Um, really quick, you didn't even have to read the text to really understand what was going on. Um, they had like a little thermometer graphic that counted down how many days they had left. You can note that they had two days left and they'd only raised two thirds of the money. So they raised like 20,000, they actually raised $40,000 in their last two days, which is pretty huge. Um, cute animals, yes. And I think at one point when the campaign was running, somebody interviewed David Attenborough about something completely different. But he was in Australia, and then somebody else asked him, do you think it's important to preserve our national forests? Who's going to say, no, it's not important? So he said yes, and they put his face on the campaign. And they tweeted at him, and then he retweeted it. So some of these things, this one got shared over 600 times. And when we looked at the reach of this campaign, it was in the millions. Um, and you know, this is all kind of free, just from people sharing it. right? So pretty effective. Okay. Get that early momentum. When you're planning your promotional strategy, make sure that you're always aiming to get to that 30% in the first week or really kind of getting a lot of momentum in the first couple of days because then that gives you lots of time to work around you know, other, other possibilities. Another thing is we find that people that don't know you will not pledge to your campaign before you're at at least 30%. All right, so we always get people that the campaign's not doing well, they email us and say, please, can you share it on social media? And we say, we can share it, but nothing's going to happen because you're only at 2% of your target, right? So you want to get to that 30% so that you can instantly start converting new groups of people. And keep everyone updated. This means during the campaign, celebrating with the people that have already pledged. Um, people kind of wrongly think that what I want is someone to pledge to my campaign and then I've been successful. No, what you want is them to pledge and then share it with other people, tell other people about it, get excited about it. And you do that by updating everybody as you go. Like, yay, we hit 10%, here's a picture of me doing something weird. Um, my favorite update ever, because you can post updates through the website, right? We have a feature that you can send updates to everybody who's pledged to your project. Was from a project called The Chaser. They're kind of a comedy magazine. They were fundraising to get a print version out. and. Or uh, I think a week before Father's Day, again very clever because using a holiday period as a reason to share something, they sent everybody who pledged to the campaign a certificate and they said, here is your free gift as a reward for you being an early uh, crowdfunding supporter. You can give this to your father, print it out and put his name in. So the certificate was like, this is to certify that blank, you have to put your dad's name, has had sex at least once. And <laughs> It was funny, as soon as I received it, I told my colleague about it, so instantly people are going to share it. You will then, I also sent it to my dad, of course, um, and then he pledged to the campaign. So it was like a really great way to not just, you know, make, some, make someone who's supported you laugh, but also to get them to share it with other people. So that's kind of the best kind of update you can have. And this applies even when things are going wrong, right? After the project, maybe your printer didn't come through, maybe they said it's going to cost another $20,000 that you don't have. All of these things don't go quiet on people. We never get people emailing us and saying like, oh, they just told me it's going to be delayed by a week. I'm so angry. I want my money back. That never happens. What we get is people saying, I've been trying to contact this person for six months. I haven't heard anything. I want my money back. People get pissed off if you just try to cut them out, right? Often we'll even have projects that completely fail, like for whatever reason, something went really wrong. And they've told us that they were surprised by how understanding their backers were. So even though they told people, like, I'm really sorry, this didn't happen, we're going to try to get you your money back, most people said, look, it's okay, we understand. Because they were kept updated all the way. They felt like they were this person's friend, even though some of them didn't know them. So they understood what had happened. But if you, like, treat them like a jerk and you never speak to them, and then suddenly you're like, oh, well, you're not going to get your thing anyway, too bad, then obviously they're going to be angry. So keep people updated all the way through to the end. So don't be a jerk. Don't be I a jerk. The message. Good rule of thumb. Easy family. enough. Okay, so why crowdfund? I love to show this particular project when I come to this slide because this product was literally a drawer that's tied by a piece of leather that you carry around with you. Just think about how comfortable that would be to carry a drawer around. And I like to imagine the creator going to a big department store like Metro or something and saying, I have a great product that you should put in your store. What is it? It's a drawer that you carry around in a piece of leather. Not going to happen, right? So 
the reason this project did well was because of the story. So the creator, she had memories of being a little girl and going to visit her auntie and her grandmother, and every time they went to visit, they would bring a basket of stuff like homemade muffins, all beautifully packaged, or flowers from their garden, or herbs, or whatever. There was this like spirit of exchanging things and hospitality in the culture that she came from, and she felt like people didn't do that anymore. And she wanted to create a product that would inspire people to do that, right? So she created a drawer. <laughs> and it's kind of proof that crowdfunding is a great way to pre-sell something and to test something that you're not sure is going to work. And often the traditional means of funding is you have to go to an investor and see whether they will give you the money for something. You have to go to a bank, see whether they will lend you the money. And both of these things are going to require that you meet their criteria, even a government grant, like, okay, is it like talking about the aging population? Check, okay, yes, you'll get $10,000. Is it talking about AIDS? No, too difficult, I don't want to do this. So often crowdfunding is about going around these traditional ways and finding the people that want to support this by telling them a really good story, even if it's not marketable or trendy, right, and testing it that way, all right? So it's a great way to pre-sell a product that you're trying to make, and as Rick said, Often, when you're, if you're in publishing or anything like that, the costs are all up front. When I ran my campaign, I wasn't trying to raise a lot of money, and I was doing it because my husband and I have a small band. Please do not Google us, it's very embarrassing. Um, and every time we performed, they, people would come up to us and say, like, you guys sound great, where's your CD? And we said, well, we don't have one because it's expensive to record. And they said, well, tell me when you have one, and I will buy it. So after like a couple of years of this, we thought, fine, we're gonna put this project up, and then we emailed all of those people and said, now you can buy it, bitches. Um, only about 30% of them did, but that 30% was enough to fund our whole recording. So from day one, we didn't spend anything. We were in the black. We actually had money in the bank to spend on this. And then we had extra money so we could pay you know, our photographer and all these people that, we kind of, that were going to do it for free anyway. So it was kind of really nice. Um, and that's much nicer than kind of having to owe somebody money from the start and being stressed out about paying it back. You also get full control and ownership over your work, right? So if it's a book and you're trying to go through a publisher, the publisher will want to make changes. You may not agree with those changes. Um, there's this great podcast that I listened to that talked about this writer who was writing about the revolution in Cuba and like it was really political, really intense book, amazing. And then Hollywood bought it because they wanted to turn it to a movie and he was so excited. And then after years and years and years of the script being written, finally it came out and it was Dirty Dancing 2, Havana Nights. It's obviously really different from the political intense book that he wrote. Now it was like a love story, dancing, woohoo. So that's kind of a good example of something that he made being completely changed to somebody else because they thought that would be more marketable. So you have a lot of control over your work. This is also good to note for government grants. We've now had people crowdfunding because they've already got a grant, but the grant only allows them to use the money on certain things. So like they can't use the money to pay themselves. They can only use the money for the printer or something like that. So they use crowdfunding to kind of top up all the extra things that they need to pay for to make this happen. Um, great way to build audiences. Again, you're testing something, and if you're in the tech business or the startup business, you want to know who are the people that are willing to pay for this. It's really easy to say to someone, that's a great idea when you're at a TED talk or a networking idea. But if you have to put money down, that's when you know that this person is really, really seriously a fan of your work. And that database of people is very, very valuable. We've had creators that come to us, every year they run a campaign and every year they build that database, that community. And they're basically building a business. Um, and it has a lot of potential. So we've had campaigns that raised $15,000 with us and then used their crowdfunding campaign to say to a government body or an investor, look, all these people want it, will you invest in me? And it's a proof of concept. Like, it's really hard to run a crowdfunding campaign. If you do it successfully, that's something that's on your portfolio, right, wherever you go. We've also had campaigns that failed miserably. We had one that was trying to raise $2.1 million to build a school. Um, they raised $60,000, so really, really, really bad. But because they got so much press attention, media attention, that there was actually an investor that came in and gave them the money to build the school. So you never really know what's gonna happen, what's gonna come out of the crowdfunding campaign that you run. Um, quickly run through our guidelines. It has to be a project, meaning it has to have a clear beginning and end. So you can't just say, I have a dog shelter, please, money. It has to be 
I'm trying to meet the next rent check, or there's this really cute dog that has no legs and I want to build him a prosthetic leg. It has to be something that people know, okay, it's successful, this is what you've done, the end. So there's no question that the money has gone to the right place. Don't use the word donations. One, because again, you don't want to be begging for money. And two, because sometimes people will ask for a tax deductible receipt if you use the word donation. So just stay away from it. Unless you're a charity, in which case you can offer those tax deductible receipts. You can't give raffles through the campaigns. You can't say, pledge $5 for a chance to win a t-shirt. You actually have to give them a t-shirt. And that's just a legal thing. We're not allowed to run raffles. Um, although we have had some creators that have done things like uh, auctions as part of their campaign. So they run a physical auction at a club or something while the campaign was running and then use that money to, to put it into the campaign. That's completely fine as long as it happens outside of the campaign itself. Um, if your project is successful, you have to take note of the fees. So 5% goes to us so we can keep the company running. 2.4% plus 30 cents is about the payment fee. So just to be safe, most of our creators will just put 8% on top of whatever the target is and factor that into fees. And these are only charged if you're successful. So if you're not successful, you don't have to do anything. No money will change hands. How do you end up on the front page? You end up there naturally when the project first launches and when it ends. Because remember that U curve? And our front page is calculated based on how many people are visiting your project and how many people are pledging to your project, okay? So it, it will happen normally as part of your campaign. And the 30% line, as I mentioned earlier, that's when people that don't know you will start to pledge. So that's really what you want to kind of work towards. Right. I'm going to talk really quickly about this. This is something that we just launched. And this is because every time I run one of these workshops, there's always a couple of people that come to me afterwards and say, I want to create my own crowdfunding platform. Will you help me? And I'm kind of like, why would I help you? You're Anyway, um, so we always get these emails. And eventually we realize that people want to create their own crowdfunding platforms because they want to do something very niche. So for instance, we have a partner that runs a platform that's just to help people fund solar panels. So like Fort Canning Park, for instance, wants to put solar panels on their roof. So they go to their community and say, will you fund me? That's all they do. So it's really specific. Um, and they want to keep that all in one place. And we also have partners where it's a university and they're crowdfunding research for their, for their students, but they want to have like all the branding to be their university and for it to be on their university's website. So we've launched something that allows you to create your own crowdfunding platform. You can brand it however you want. You can stick it on your website if you want to. Um, the only mention of us will be powered by Possible at the bottom, I think. And all of the projects on your page show up on Possible.com, so you get access to our community. Because the hardest thing about building a platform is not the, pla the technology, it's getting people to actually pledge to it, the community that's behind it. So if you come from an organization or you're thinking about starting something up that's really kind of built around a crowdfunding platform, this is something for you. Um, and I'll send stuff to you guys in the workshop notes that you can take a look at the website. All right, first of all, why possible? Um, I talked earlier about our success rate, and I really believe that we have this high success rate because every single project that comes through, we see, like a human looks at it, and we send you an email and says, hey, do you want any help about anything? We will help you. They're awesome. We really do this. Um, most people say no, most people are fine to do it on their own, Sometimes we bug you a bit, like if you see your project's not doing well, we'll email you again and say, hey, we really, we're serious about helping, we're real people. Um, the best, one of the best parts about that is that we require you to upload a photo ID of yourself, and the things that people upload in that photo ID are just the best. We actually have a channel on Slack, which is our chat app, of all the things that people have uploaded on that. So somebody, this is a photo ID, so it's meant to be your government, like your driver's license or your IC. Yeah, I used my passport. I didn't know we could be funny about it. Oh, you're not supposed to be funny about <laughs> it. We will reject you. So we had someone who literally had like selfie of the front and then you're supposed to put the back as well. Selfie of the back. <laughs> and we were just laughing because they had to get someone else to take the photo of the back of their head. And like, there's two people in the world that thought that meant the back of your head. Great. Um, we also had someone upload a picture of their cat. We had someone upload a poem. All of these got rejected. That's pretty much the only reason we reject a project if the yeah the photo's wrong. But we will give you advice on pretty much any aspect of your project, however you like. We will call you on the phone. We will just look at it by email if you're kind of shy. Um, I give a lot of advice to people on their press releases to try to get them kind of extra help, even if I don't have time to send them out myself. 
So really make use of it because we have worked with a lot of projects, so we're kind of in the best position to make you successful. Um, Ta-da, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Rick. Are you okay to stick around for questions? Yeah, of course, of course. Right? And also thanks to Robin and Seth and all the people from the OMG team for hosting this in this great space. Uh, they run a lot of really cool courses, so you should check them out if you like to build stuff with your hands. Um, yeah, I think you probably send them more information in the email, right? Share something. And thank you to Edges Yes, the people that are recording. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to open to questions. If you have questions for me or for Rick or for the lab, please send them my way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So there's possible primarily to reward based crowdfunding? Re reward based crowdfunding? Yeah, as in not equity, but only reward. We only do reward at the moment. We're we're looking at opening equity in, because we're based in Australia, we have to kind of look at what Australia is doing and Australia hasn't released equity, they're doing it this year. Um, I do know that there are quite a few equity crowdfunding platforms in Singapore, so you could probably look at that if you were looking at that. For those that don't know, equity allows you to give a share in your business instead of a reward, or in addition to a reward as well. So it's kind of appealing to bigger capital rounds. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. I know how to sell products like that, like education, like a lot of people, all students. Yeah. And let's say, how are you able to, say, verify that the buyer or the one who's getting to it is the Asian product? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so when you pledge to a project, you have to have a credit card. And you can't have a credit card unless you're well, at least you 18. Oh yeah, you can use PayPal, but PayPal is usually linked to a credit card or a bank account. The vast majority of people use a credit card, not a bank account. So that's kind of the way that we verify. Um, but again, because we have people looking at the site all the time um, and kind of approving the projects, we're able to kind of monitor that. And yeah, like, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm, uh, well, you know, this is, uh when it's your own business and your own licenses, you have to take that pretty seriously. So uh, I'm actually hand delivering all of the uh, the bottles from my campaign. So you know, if I show up and it's a six year old, I'm going to be like, "Sorry, buddy, I'll give them your money back." But yeah. giving a six year old a hundred dollars is a bit weird too. So I, I don't know. I'll play it by ear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good point. Anybody else? Yeah. Any good examples of uh, short films that successfully got? Yeah, we have a lot of short films on the site, including yeah, including one. So Pam Oi's band, which I think is called Ugly in the Morning or Ugly in the City or something. Ugly in the Morning, yes. So they crowdfunded for a music video, um, which was shown in a film. We've also had uh, 13 players, 13 fingers. There's a film by um, Jun Kai. They did their short film with us. Uh, Singapore Minstrel actually started as a short film and then was expanded out to a full-length film. It's important to note that we've also had short films that crowdfunded that short film and then came back and crowdfunded again to make it a full-length film. So, yeah, film is one of our biggest categories. Yeah? Speaking of which, um, maybe could you talk a bit about stretch goals and how it works? Yeah, um, so you can always raise more than your target. Um, and something called the stretch goal, if you're not familiar with it, means once you hit, for instance, $10,000, you say, if we reach $20,000, this is what you're all going to get, and kind of expand it that way. If you're hoping to raise a lot more than what your target is, have a strategy for how you're going to hit stretch goals before you even launch. Because a lot of people are like, yay, we hit our target, now let's try to think of something, and then it's not really done properly, and you know it doesn't work. Usually stretch goals, are you have to make it very clear to people what they're going to get if you hit that stretch goal. So for instance, if it's a cause-based project, going back to like an animal shelter, you can say, Great, we've raised money to build this, but if we raise this, we'll also be able to build something extra. So really kind of making it important, or saying that like, okay, if we raise this, everybody who's already pledged will get this extra thing. That's also a really great way, because you're trying to motivate the existing community to go and continue to pledge to other people. Yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you were thinking that the risk guy was going to do just do that is for the Yes. So any way that Yes. Yeah. So whenever you use your credit card on the internet, in case you don't already know this, or like 
if you use your credit card pretty much anywhere and you don't get the thing, you can call your credit card company and say, this is a scam, I didn't get the thing. And the credit card company will settle it for you. We also settle disputes between creators and pledges. Um, so if a pledger emails us and said, hey, I never got this, so I got it and it was broken, and the creator's not responding, because we have the creator's ID, we have their address, we have their phone number, we're able to kind of call them and we try to mediate between them. We've never gotten to a point so far, I mean, touch wood, where we've had to like say, okay, now you need to sue each other, um, thankfully. But it, it, I think it's happened in the States with bigger technology projects. So as a creator, please be aware that you need to deliver. Even if it's delayed, you need to eventually be delivering it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can set it yourself. So every single reward, you have to put at the bottom what your estimated delivery is. And this can range from three weeks to a year. So we recently had a film that crowdfunded with us in 2012, and their film was only shown last year. So that's three years. But as long as you tell people what to predict and you keep them updated, there isn't really, like, people are not going to not pledge because, you know, it's, it's a long way away. The only exception is if you're launching a campaign that's a product and it's coming out around Christmas, make it really clear to people whether or not you're going to be able to deliver by Christmas because you get that a lot. Sometimes even though it says there, you know, June 2017, people will still be like, hey, why didn't I get it by Christmas? So just make sure you make that clear to people. Yes? of uh, products that have been launched in other uh, platforms that yeah. I can't think of ones that failed and then came to us. I can think of ones that were successful on other platforms and then came to us because they wanted to launch to a different market or they wanted to try again. So it does happen. Um, but the tricky thing about that is usually that the first time you've run a campaign, you've gotten all the press attention and all that kind of stuff. The second time you launch it, it's, unless you have a different angle, it's difficult to get people to cover you again. Um, on Possible, we've had projects that failed the first time and then came back and were successful the other time. That's kind of more common. Yeah. But in this case, um, for, for products, uh, that physical products we ship, um, do you happen to know uh, how quickly how we package products we ship? Um, yeah, shipping is the, the real nightmare. I mean, you guys aren't shipping outside of Singapore. Is that no. the legal stuff? Or? Well, there's there's a bit of legal stuff. So, you know, typically with alcohol, um, everybody's scared of it. <laughs> uh, so if you ship to another country, you can't technically just send somebody alcohol because you're not licensed. We're licensed in Singapore to sell alcohol. Um, but I wouldn't want to ship to Australia because then there's a chance that if customs sees it and they take it and now the person doesn't get what they paid for. So number one, it's a customer obsession thing. Like, you know, if, if I promise I'm going to give you something, I don't want to let you down. Um, but also in terms of the shipping, then it's expensive. Shipping is very expensive. I mean, even here in Singapore, uh, they changed their name, but I love the name before. Rocket Uncle, that would deliver stuff for super cheap. Um, like using a service like that, you, you can deliver all over the island. Um, but you know, then you have to worry about breakage and you know, all of that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a lot to consider when you're talking about shipping. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if you're sending something by you know, just in an envelope, I don't know what, what product you're, you're thinking of, but depending on the size of it, I would try and stay local. I, and the other thing to think about too is the community angle. Um, you know, you're, you're, your reach is, is more powerful if, uh, if you can control it and you, you can access it and you can touch it. If, if you think, well, there are, you know, how many billion people in the world, so if I get even like half a percent of that, I'll be, but that's a big market. So knowing who your target customer is and, and the way you're going after them, just like you said earlier, is, is really critical too. And I find, you know, if you're gonna try and market to somebody, let's say from, from Thailand or somebody from Australia, it's gonna be a totally different pitch. The, the cultures are different, the people are different, what they're interested in is different. So um, I think right right there, that limits some of your shipping options. But I mean, if you're trying to do a, t a campaign from here and you're targeting you know, uh, middle-aged French people in, in France, then yeah, you're gonna have to get involved with shipping to get yeah. your stuff to them. So you can always set different shipping amounts that people can add into. Um, to make it easier, some of our creators will just have two different rewards. And they'll be like, the Australia reward and the international reward, and the cost will be different and shipping's already built in. Right, so um, in this case, the, the, the price for 
the amounts to catch, uh, you get the delivery fee within... Yeah, you can choose. You can either say add postage, because some projects you, there's a choice to pick it up so you don't have to add postage, or if you want to make it easier and everything's going to be posted, then you can just build it into the cost and just say no, no added postage cost. Um, just as an extra point, we've had projects that were like in Australia but manufactured in China and then they had backers in the States. What they actually did was they asked the Chinese manufacturers to split up the orders and send some of them directly to the States. And that was a lot cheaper than sending it to Australia and then sending it back to the States. So that's something you can think about when you choose a manufacturer. Shipping is awful. Yeah, it is. Uh, There's no fixed rate. Like even Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they, they don't have an answer to that and they're a lot bigger than us. It's but, really challenging. Yeah. In Australia, we're working with partners now who can automate the shipping for you and they will build it into the site. So like as soon as it's gone, it's like boom, 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 you get all the labels, you send it. But there's no option to do that internationally at the moment. It just isn't because it's so expensive. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so your business needs registered at the time of the... Yeah. You can be an individual, so you don't even have to do this. The only time you need to be registered is if you're trying to give tax stuff to receipts. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Oh, okay. Well, people can always choose that they don't want a reward. So sometimes someone just wants to pledge to a campaign, they don't really care about the reward. And then in terms of making sure that people have a reward they want, just have a variety. Like have five to eight different amounts, different kinds of things. I don't have ten rewards that are all postcards. And then if somebody doesn't want a postcard, you've lost them. Um, this is also quite important to theatre companies who are funding productions. And the production is like in Singapore, but they have funders overseas. And then those funders can't pledge because I can't come to Singapore. So we will tell them, can you release like a, a journal? Can you print a journal of the production? Can you give them a DVD of the production so that it applies to those people? The other thing that I would recommend doing, and this applies to every aspect of your campaign, is once you launch, see what is popular, what's working, which reward is selling out or people are choosing a lot of, then introduce variations to that reward and take out the ones that maybe aren't working. So we are able to actually like update them all the way. You can update, you can edit any reward that nobody's pledged to. So if you have like a $10,000 reward and nobody chooses it, you can take it out and put something else in. Um, you can't, obviously can't edit a reward that someone's chosen because then you could just take away a bottle of gin and put like a matchbox or something and that would be very good. Um, but yeah, you can kind of add it as you go. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Can I understand like for, let's say, a hundred dollar? Yes. What is the percentage that goes to all the... Credit card fees and all that? Yeah, so our, if you if you raised a thousand dollars, our fee would be fifty dollars, and the credit card companies would take I don't know thirty dollars, twenty to thirty dollars. So it's just, it's eight percent just back to that. So that's, that's, that's all. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is there a correlation between like at what stage of completion your product is to mm. the success rate of? Your well, if it's a product, like we've had some products that there's not even a prototype that's kind of difficult because then people are like, uh, is this going to get built? Especially now that a lot of big tech projects have failed terribly. Um, people are more suspicious. Uh, but it's also like you can't sell a product that's a film and not have any photos or any footage. So it's kind of not so much which point you have to be at as what do you have that will convince people you can do this and that it's going to be great. Yeah. Because we have people that fund it all different. They'll do it before they've even started filming. We have people that have finished filming and then they fund. It's really up to you. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to stop it so that we can kind of disperse. But remember, if you're too shy or if you think of something later, please just drop me an email or you can stay back to talk. I don't mind. Thank you so much. And thanks again to everybody who was part of it. Or you can even know someone who does, please buy Singapore made gin. It's really cool. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Have a nice evening. Thanks, guys.